Hello, everyone uh, who are already here and who are joining us in this introductory part. I am very happy to welcome all of you in this EU Law Working Group event, Why to Read the Transformation of Europe Today on Transformations Constitutional Imaginary. I am Birgit Daza. I am the EU Law Working Group Coordinator and a researcher at the Law Department as well. And as you can see, we are frankly astonished by the number of people who have registered and are attending this seminar today. And I think it's because of um, two reasons. First, that we have two very distinguished speakers today, Professor Jan Komarek from the University of Copenhagen and Professor Joseph Weiler from New York University. And second, we are discussing a true classic in EU studies today, the transformation of Europe. And Professor Komarek has thought deeply about why to read this piece today and what are some of the underlying assumptions, ideas, ideologies uh, behind this text published almost 30 years ago. Um, this event was, of course, supposed to happen in Florence, physically, for obvious reasons. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do that. But I am particularly thankful for both Professor Weiler and Professor Komarek, who were very accommodating. And uh, instead of cancelling the event, allowed it to be moved here online. Before we start, I have some organizational issues. Uh, that I will explain to you, as we are so many and uh, from so far away, in a way. So the setup of the seminar will be the usual working group event we have always had. So I will give the floor 20 minutes for Professor Komarek to present his paper, then um, around 15, 20 minutes to Professor Weiler to give his response. And then I will give again the floor to Professor Komarek for a reply. Uh, this part of the event will be recorded, so I kindly ask everyone are having already their microphones and videos off. You probably won't be able to turn them on, uh, but just as you know, this part of the event might be then later on published on the EY YouTube page. And the second part is questions and answers. So we will be taking your questions, whoever has one, and I will introduce the procedure how to ask your questions. So we have agreed that you can ask your question in the chat functionality here in Zoom. So if you have a question already during the seminar, just write in the chat your full name. That will go to the host, Andrea, and he will forward all the names in chronological order to me. So I will be able to give you the floor for your questions. And then you can obviously, of course, turn your microphone and video on to present your question. And also, we kindly ask you to um, introduce yourself. But without further ado, I then give the floor to Professor Komarek to give us an account why to read the Transformation of Europe today. And perhaps additional to this, this you can also put this paper in the broader perspective of your research project in Die Courts uh, in Copenhagen. Please. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, to you, Birgit, because you are the one who had this idea to organize this presentation. And of course, also to Joseph, who agreed to comment on my paper, which deals so much with his thought and uh, the transformation of Europe. For me, it is a bit difficult moment now because it's the first time I'm presenting it uh, before such a wide audience. And uh, originally it was planned as a small working group gathering in Florence and now there is lots of people listening. So I hope that uh, I will have something on the plate to offer to you and uh, that we together uh, are going to learn something about uh, this question on why read a piece which is as you said almost uh, 30, p uh, 30 uh, years uh, old for me or and also possibly also for the audience at the ui the answer may seem obvious that of course it is one of the most influential pieces ever written in european studies but i have recently learned when i was presenting this paper at various uh, places, not only to lawyers, but also to historians and other people who deal with Europe, broadly speaking, then they ask not only about what the transformation of Europe is about, but they even ask 
why is Joseph Weiler so important? So part of this presentation is also trying to deal with this question. Why did the piece, at least in my opinion, and there may be some empirics. So I also used uh, citation network analysis to see how many people has, have cited the article and they are quite a few. Maybe surprisingly, most of them would be in the political science and international relations. But at the same time, there is a mark which was left by the structure which was created by the transformation of Europe and also the work which Joseph Weiler had produced before the transformation of Europe was published in 1991, which you can then see in many of the writings, just to mention one of those, possibly also surprisingly when I recently reviewed a book by Dieter Grimm, a famous former judge of the Constitutional Court in Germany. When you read his account of European constitutionalism, it is very much informed by the reading of the transformation of Europe, which is also obvious from uh, the uh, sites which you can find in the book. So possibly among us to debate the question whether the piece is important is not the most interesting one. And the more interesting question can be why read it today? Since obviously the piece is on the reading lists of many courses on European law, and I assume that many people maybe even didn't read all 100 pages of the article and would rather have an idea of what the paper is about or the article is about as much as many people do not read Pankhan and Laws today and we all know what Pankhan and Laws refers to uh, today. But there may be a reason why to read it in full today, to learn something for today. And that is something I tried to do in this paper and I tried to do it with a specific methodological tool which I must admit in the present version of the paper is perhaps not used to its uh, fullest uh, capacity. But when I was thinking again about how I'm going to present the paper today, and I've been working on possibly fifth or sixth version of the same paper because I have been working on this paper for last two years, it seemed to me that I finally, hopefully, was able to find a way how to answer that question, why to read it, today and what today the transformation of Europe uh, can tell us and how the notion of constitutional imaginaries, which I put also into the title of my paper, can help us to understand this. So possibly I would like to structure my presentation today in three steps. To start with this central notion for my project, the uh, constitutional imaginary and how it can possibly help us to read the transformation of Europe. Then second, I will go briefly through the paper because my assumption is hopefully that people at least took a look at the paper if they didn't read it. And uh, finally, I will try to present this key through which I think the transformation of Europe can be productively read even today and what people in today's Europe's condition can learn from uh, reading the paper uh, today. So to start with the notion of constitutional imaginaries and why I am using it. Now, of course, many people came to the field of European constitutionalism through reading some important pieces, not only the transformation of Europe, but there will be other thinkers who have produced uh, bulks of ideas through which we understand what the European Union is and what kind of law it has and whether it may have a constitution. A uh, debate which was particularly important in the mid 2000s, which was the time when I was entering the field. And that's why also for me, the question whether it has a constitution didn't really have any real meaning because I came from a country which joined the European Union in 2004. And for us, the whole period of 1990s was essentially becoming a democratic state ruled by the rule of law and uh, having a free market economy and that was what the European Union represented for us. And I think many of my compatriots understood the European Union in this way and we didn't realize that the European Union became such entity only in the course of the 1990s. And in my view, the transformation of Europe is a piece which best represents this move of uh, the European economic community into the community or even union, which was the process to which also the post-communist transformation or the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 uh, has helped. Now, 
through that or with that, uh, what had to come uh, was also a specific sort of, we may say ideology, but I prefer the notion of imaginary because it doesn't have this Marxist baggage uh, behind it. And that is the whole set of ideas through which we understand uh, the world of public law and how the exercise of public authority is justified and understood by not only the government, which then justifies its actions with reference to that imaginary, but also the people who are governed uh, through uh, those rules, may then understand to be living in a polity of which they are participants and which is legitimated through that imaginary. And uh, to me, it is interesting to focus on people who are helping or who help to produce such imaginaries. And that is where my project is set. So it doesn't deal with what we would say ordinary people think about the European Union, because in the end, to me, it wouldn't be that much interesting because what ordinary people think is with all respect, not very sophisticated. But there is a level of ideas which is being produced by intellectuals and public lawyers, which then informs this uh, sort of imaginary through which we then read law and uh, its system. And that's what I want to do uh, in the project. And for me, the transformation of Europe and the work of Joseph Weiler was an ideal starting point because to me it was the sort of imaginary through which I started to understand the European Union. And as I found out in a nice collection of essays, which were written at the occasion of, I think it was the 25th anniversary of the publication of the uh, essay, uh, some of them described this process through which they started to understand the European Union and its law in a very different light. So before reading the transformation of Europe, and that's, uh, either Sasha Somek or Julio Baquero Cruz, the two chapters in the same book, say it was something boring, something administrative, something bureaucratic. And then suddenly you read the transformation of Europe and it becomes about public philosophy, about the way we want to live in Europe, the way we understand the constitution. It becomes colorful, it becomes something you want to do, you want to be concerned with, you want to study. And that was precisely uh, my experience and Hence, my starting point and opening of the project comes uh, through the transformation, although it's not, of course, not the whole project, and uh, it's only the beginning of the project, which is uh, much wider. Now, through that, what I could do in the project and in the paper I am now presenting to you is to go through the transformation and try to understand what sort of imaginary it presents. So, in what kind of sets of ideas it is located uh, by what it is being informed. And that is, I think, the version of the paper which is now, uh, or which has been circulated among uh, the participants. So in the paper, I firstly go through the essay itself and I identify two parts in the essay, which for those who know Joseph Weiler for quite long, it won't be surprising and they would know that the first, what I call the analytical part of the essay was most likely written as a PhD thesis already. And that is this very well known tie or nexus between law and politics and the principles through which the more binding the law becomes, then there is an intense pressure on getting voice in European Union politics, which may be seen as even a principle of international law as it is described in the transformation of Europe. And that is, in my view, the part which originated in the beginning of the 1980s. And then you read the essay, and then there is a break in the middle of the essay, and then comes a more critical part, which has been written as a reflection on the Single European Act. But in my view, the publication perhaps came too late, because the transformation was published in 1991, when the Single European Act was obviously not the biggest event, in the European history because in between what came was 1989, the fall of Berlin Wall, and the whole new imaginary opened and the possibility to create not only a functioning single European market, which was aimed by the single European Act, but even a political union or maybe a federation. And as we know, federation or the F word was debated in the course of the Maastricht uh, Treaty negotiations and then it was duly 
uh, erased from all the documents which could be produced by the intergovernmental conference at the time. So that's the analytical part, but the more interesting uh, part of the paper comes when it comes to the critique and that relates more closely to what I call the constitutional imaginary. And in that, what is interesting to me is that uh, it may have to do, and that is something which possibly Joseph Weiler can say better than I as a reader of his work, but as I also want to make clear, uh, this is not to be an intellectual biography of the person, but it seeks to be a history of ideas, which focuses on writings and which seeks to understand the ideas as ideas. But it seems to me that the move from Florence, from Europe, the moment when the analytical part of the essay was written, so essentially what was published in the Yearbook of European Law and what was the PhD thesis, and the end of the 1980s and what then became the critical part of the transformation of Europe is very much informed by the move from Europe to the United States. And as I see it, and there is a contradiction, and I really came to this contradiction many times when I was presenting this paper or even before I presented this first paper when I talked about European constitutional ideologies and also the work of uh, Joseph Weiler. And that is that it seems to me that law is presented through uh, the lens of liberal legalism or legalist liberalism as it was then very uh, perhaps not dominant, but it was a very important intellectual current in American law schools and at that time came to a sort of crisis. And what is principally meant by uh, liberal legalism is a strong role for courts, emphasis on rights, and uh, the belief in the market as an organizing principle for interpersonal relations. Now, that's the American uh, legal liberalism, and that is, of course, not the transformation of Europe. But there are parts of this legalism which pervade the whole presentation of law in the transformation of Europe. Now, the paradox or the contradiction or the problem one encounters when uh, you read the transformation of Europe is precisely this liberal notion of law and the emphasis on legal institutions and courts, and at the same time, the emphasis on a deeper ethos and values and objectives which get criticized, which get analyzed in the second part of the essay, and also what we can read in the work of Joseph Weiler since the transformation of Europe. So it's not a careful legal analysis, which we can find in the first part of the essay, but it's rather the engagement with not only politics, because politics would not be the work which really refers to what Joseph Weiler, in my view, is interested in, but it's really this deep ethos of what European integration uh, should be about. So once one sees behind this, then we can read the other parts of the transformation of Europe, perhaps more critically. And uh, what also struck me when I read the transformation of Europe, and uh, grant me, I really read it <laughs> perhaps too many times when I was working on this paper. One, one thing which strikes is also a very peculiar kind or presentation of the history of European integration. So in the paper, in the transformation of Europe, it begins only with the Treaty of Rome and the beginning of the uh, Treaty on the European Economic Community, as if the previous attempts at the establishment of European political community, European defense community, and also a quite different structure of the European Poland steel community is not really there. And we come to the beginning of the European integration only in 1958, which at that time didn't allow for the same kind of utopian projects as uh, possibly were in circulation at the beginning of the 1950s. And to me, that's another sort of mark of the kind of imaginary which uh, we can identify in uh, the transformation of Europe, and that is a very specific use of the history, which is not unique to the transformation, but uh, 
which I think is a wider and uh, more interesting phenomenon, and that is how lawyers are using history for their purposes. And in the paper, I also refer to a similar debate in the United States where constitutional lawyers constantly say, what we do is an argument, we don't do history, we use history as an argument. And that is a different thing than uh, doing history as historians. And that is also something which is now perhaps more interesting in the light of the movement of new legal historians, and some of them are my colleagues in Copenhagen, who in my view are after things which are not that interesting to lawyers, because we lawyers are interested in these constructive uses of history and how we lawyers can uh, use uh, history. Uh, there are other elements, but uh, I see that I've been talking for quite a while, so I want to come to the third and concluding part of this presentation, and that is something which is not in the paper, but uh, which I hope is eventually what I really wanted to say in the paper, but I was not able to in the previous iteration, and that is why to read the transformation of Europe today. So throughout the paper, and also in this short presentation, I talked about the constitutional imaginary as a set of ideas, beliefs, which help to justify a collective rule uh, through the government and which also helps people to understand themselves as being part of the community which uh, creates uh, these rules. Now, if there is one thing which I guess many people would say what the transformation of Europe brought to the legal discourse on European integration, that is the attention which lawyers had to pay to politics and also vice versa, that uh, the students of politics, political scientists, international relations scholars had to take law seriously. So each side had to learn from the other and the transformation of Europe puts together these two sides and really focuses on this nexus between law and politics in European integration. And to an extent, it is true, and that's also the core of this principle, which seeks to find balance between law and politics. So exit voice and loyalty is an expression of uh, this balance between law and politics. But in my view, there is this tension I already alluded to, and that is that whole legal imaginary is still tied to the liberal paradigm of law, which is strong role of courts, uh, strong role for rights, and the belief that the market is the organizing principle for uh, the self-governing polity. So that's liberal legalism. And the legal side of the transformation of Europe is very much tied to this. Whereas politics is of course about this sort of law, Law is in the context of the transformation of Europe presented as a key structural constraint on politics. And then politics is of course uh, explored in many different keys, although the transformation of Europe, because it is not the piece about the whole of the European integration, it could not be, it has 100 pages, but to describe what was going on, you would need far more than 100 pages. But what I think the problem is, is that one of the key messages of the transformation of Europe, of the second part, of the critical part, was this attempt at creating a community rather than unity. Remember, this is one of the key messages of the transformation of Europe, again, also brought about or remembered by the other contributors to the book I mentioned. So if there is a strong message of the transformation of Europe, it is also this attempt to recreate a community among the persons which would transcend the limits or limitations of the nation statehood and would be able to find a new community, a new kind of organization through which states, which will not disappear, that's very important. So the transformation of Europe is not about the disappearance of states, but states and their peoples would find new ways how they would relate one to another. So that is, I think, the deepest ethos of the, not only the transformation of Europe, but uh, of all the work which Joseph Weiler produced since the transformation of Europe was published. But then this communitarian vision is still tied to this sort of very liberal notion of law, 
And my question, and I don't know how to answer it because possibly I am also, a, I do not want to say that Joseph Weiler is a slave, but I sometimes feel like a slave of this legal vision that what the transformation of Europe wants to wants to insist, and there is a part which makes it quite explicit, law cannot be reduced to politics. So at one place, Joseph Weiler says that his theory of law and the transformation of Europe is the pure theory of law or autopoetic uh, theory of law. I think what it wants to say, the essay, is that law is has its own ethos, its own logic, that uh, simply we as lawyers cannot transcend this legal logic. And to me, the, the biggest question, and I will very shortly present or say what it, what it tells us today, is whether we as lawyers can ever transcend this legal logic, which seems to be tied to this liberal paradigm of legalism, and whether that can be realized through this or whether this sort of law can ever realize the communitarian vision, which is a vision for European integration, which is about creation of these new relationships between states and peoples. And why this is so important today again, and I realized it uh, when I was now, as many people are following on first the German constitutional court decision, and also what happens in Poland and in Hungary, and again, the rule of law and the importance of courts is being involved and the court of justice and landlords, presidents is being heralded as instating a new stage of European constitutionalism. And again, it just shows the limitations of, or it doesn't show the limitations. It's tied to this limited liberal vision of law and constitutionalism which was not successful in 2000s, and in my view, won't be successful today if it promises more than it can achieve. What it can achieve is to enforce rules as they are being created by the European Union. But what it certainly cannot achieve is this communitarian or more ambitious vision of tying states and peoples into a new kind of polity which we want outlined by the transformation of Europe, but was of course until today never uh, realized. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, very much for this rich take on this piece. And now I give the floor to Professor Weiler to provide his side of the story. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't find myself uh, disagreeing with what much of what uh, Jan Komarek said. And I also, I don't believe that an author, either of a piece of literature or a piece of legal writing, is the best interpreter of that piece of writing. It stands for itself and it's the reader who becomes sovereign. Uh, I want to start with, uh, two rather trivial points where I think maybe the, cons the transformation of Europe is relevant today. Uh, the first one is that it uh, presents a non-statal view of the European Union, uh, the way we say it in Europe, a non-federal view of the European Union. Uh, it's uh, neither explicitly nor implicitly this idea that the best the form, the best form of European integration is some form of a United States of Europe. It really militates very strongly against that. And I think that's the lesson that is still uh, relevant today. Uh, the second thing which I think is relevant today is that it places the human conditions and real human being at the basis of the project of European integration. Uh, so, it's not really at the end of the day about states, but about uh, the lives of people and the way they relate to each other. Uh, I was a bit surprised, but maybe it's true. Uh, I never thought of myself as paying much attention to the importance of market in the construction of Europe. I know it's there, but I've written very little about it. So, uh, that didn't resonate with me, although 
I'm not saying that it's not true, but at least consciously, neither then nor now, <coughs> that is, I've ever thought of that as driving my thinking about European integration and the European Union. And uh, I don't also think that it's a liberal uh, conception of law. Uh, I really think the, the deep roots of what informs my understanding of law and its role in society and its relationship to the European, uh, to the human condition is uh, nomos, which is uh, the basis of Judaism. And in some ways, when Jan says, uh, we need to transcend law in order to reach uh, uh, huma real humanity, because law is hopeless in trying to achieve that, that's a 2000 debate of Christianity rebelling against uh, the Jewish concept of nomos as the basis of the human condition. Uh, I don't think we will resolve that debate, but I think it definitely informs uh, my thinking about it. So how do I relate nomos in that understanding to the transformation of Europe, the article, and to generally my vision of society and the human condition. I see nomos and law as offering at least two very fundamental uh, dimensions to the way we think of ourselves as human, as human beings. The first one is liberty. Uh, without law, we lose our liberty because we are slaves to our human condition. We are slaves to our passions, we are slaves to our desires, we are slaves to our interest, etc. And the role that Nomos plays in Judaism is to offer you a liberty by submitting to law, you are dominating the slavery that comes from your human conditions, a kind of liberty which in my view is false. Uh, so I think it has a very deep humanizing uh, dimension which uh, neither Jesus nor St. Paul really understood in their rebellion against nomos. Uh, you abolish nomos and at the worst extreme we are in a Hobbesian state where law then is an external dimension to control these passions. If you internalize nomos it brings out your humanity the way you are liberated from your passions. To put it a little bit crudely the way you are not an animal so I think, uh, to me, that's a much more important influence than any liberal conception of the mid-60s in the United States. Uh, and the second thing that Nomos is important is that it creates community because you become an ethical community, you become a community of values uh, to the extent that the law uh, encapsulates and reflects those deep values, it's a proxy for understanding of being part of a community. Now, it doesn't happen automatically, and I don't think that the way European law and European integration has been particularly successful in that, but that's precisely because they always used it in an instrumental way law simply as an instrument to achieving certain policies and in diametrically opposite to what Jan was saying, not law as a value in itself, as something that is constitutive and reflective of what it means uh, to be a community. So, as I said, there are two immediate and more trivial values to the Constitution of Europe, uh, the non-federalist view of European integration and the fact that the human being and individual are at the center of it. And that has tremendous consequences because it locates the ultimate sense of authority, legitimacy of power in the state and not in the European Union itself. And uh, in the theory of equilibrium, which I presented in the Constitution of Europe, where I said strong legal integration is important and is successful not just as a social science analytical thing, but as a predictive normative thing. It's, it can be accepted because people, states, communities don't feel that they're losing control. Uh, 
I remember throughout the, the 90s and the early 2000s, people said, you see, your theory of equilibrium has been disproved by this wonderful uh, progress in European integration, the Treaty of European Union, the uh, Economic and Monetary Union. But the last 10 years have seen maybe a revival of this idea that the problems we're seeing with Euroscepticism uh, and other examples are precisely because of the equilibrium that I posited in the transformation of Europe as not just accidental, but necessary and a key to the future success of the European Union not to break that equilibrium. Uh, but at a deeper level, the transformation of Europe is an invitation to think about law in this deep sense, certainly not in my understanding market and not a liberal view of law, but a deep-seated understanding of law as offering liberty and offering community. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Weiler. And now I give a chance for Jan to reply. All right. Uh, well, thank you for these comments. Although it seems that uh, I might appear that I have misread the essay. And now I will try to explain why I read it in the way uh, I did. And possibly I will start with this notion of the liberal conception of law. And I think it really is different to read only the transformation of Europe and not to read the rest of the works which were published after that. Since it seems to me, and uh, also when I read uh, the essay, uh, sorry, the working paper, which was possibly the first published version of uh, the first analytical part of the essay, and then the PhD uh, uh, thesis, it appeared to me that there is this uh, a rather functional or even instrumental understanding of law and that all this thinking about law as nomos and its deeper ethos comes only much later and that the transformation of Europe opens this up but it is not presented uh, there and I in one version of the paper I continued with dealing with the afterwards which are added to the transformation of Europe at the occasion of its further publications. And of course, I also continue reading and thinking about other pieces which were published later. But why, why I chose to stop at 1991 version of the paper and possibly with this more instrumental and liberal understanding of law, to me it was because that was the kind of imaginary which was created back then and which had the influence on other people which might have then disagreed with uh, Joseph Weiler and they may have departed and one such thing which is quite interesting is that if I remember correctly most people at the EUI working in the mid 2000s supported the project of the constitution on Europe whereas Joseph Weiler was opposing it and I think it had to do with a different understanding of what law can achieve and what sort of law the European Union should have if it wants to become this uh, new kind of polity which would help to realize, as uh, Joseph Feiler described it, human condition in a new way and would allow people and states relate in a different way than they did under old international law and in the system as it existed in Europe uh, after uh, the war. So one striking thing and uh, I did not want to read the transformation of Europe as someone who reads it, you know, after 30 years of debate on the European Union and just pointing to some inadequacies or what Joseph Weiler didn't know in 1991 and all that, because that was not the point. But I really wanted to try to put myself as far as possible into that moment of the beginning of the 1990s, because for many reasons, that is the moment which is chiefly important for not only me personally, but also that was really the moment when many possibilities in European constitutional imaginaries opened uh, at that time. And one striking thing about the transformation of Europe is lots of these allusions to the United States experience. So it might have to do with students 
who were editing the piece which then went to the Yellow Journal. And as it comes in the United States, students, they may add lots of footnotes which were not really intended by the author. But uh, uh, there is uh, references to Oliver van der Holmes or references to or allusions to the decisions of the Supreme Court, which in a way create an imaginary of the United States, not the, you know, of America, but the United States of Europe. Whereas it is true for sure that explicitly the transformation of Europe rejects this statal and federal vision on the model of the United States of America. So there, is, con there are contradictions in the essay itself, but I think that for many people, these allusions to the United States experience was one of the reasons why the piece was so influential and was picked up by people who wished the European Union to become the United States of Europe and they didn't read the second part of the essay that closely, or for them, the transformation of Europe is about imposing European Union authority on the member states. It is about direct effect supremacy, human rights, and competencies. So that is uh, the part of the essay which is, I, in my view, most read in the courses on European Union law. And this more critical part is then left unexplored. And on the notion of law, which is expressed, and I would argue not so much in the transformation of Europe, but in the later writings, which came later after the transformation of Europe, on that I, I fully agree. That is the question I am having in, for myself when I think about the kind of law we have in Europe, not only at the level of the European Union, but in European states, which take part of uh, the European Union. and whether we can create uh, the numus to which uh, Joseph Pali referred uh, in his uh, response and how we can move beyond the, ce the celebrations and yet again, because that is what we are observing today again, celebrations of the European Court of Justice and what it does to save the rule of law in Europe and to help to again uh, create the new constitution for the European Union uh, created by the court and that to me is exactly wrong and I think the transformation of Europe very nicely shows why it is the case but at least the transformation of Europe and I think its image of law as it is presented there that is something to which people who are celebrating the court of justice refer to today and they would I think disagree with Joseph Weiler today when he would say that is certainly not the kind of law which I imagine for uh, the European Union uh, to have. Professor Weiler, any I remarks? I think that's a, it's a very fair reading and you're absolutely right that uh, when I replied to you, I was taking the Constitution of Europe in my mind as a 10-year project, which, would, which started with uh, the working paper number two of the EUI and ended with the Yale Law Journal and just evolved over time. And I was reading it in the light of a more sort of holistic reflection. But I think your reading is very fair if you just take it when it was written and how it will have been read. I think it's an acute, uh, it's an acute analysis. Can I make one more little comment on Nomos? Nomos is covenantal. So in that respect, it's Kantian. It's not, uh, it's a heteronymous law, which is accepted autonomously. And that's the motto of my book, The Constitution of Europe. Uh, if you want it, you take it. If you don't want it, you don't take it. But it cannot be imposed on you heteronymously if you are not internalized it in a Kantian sense and want to be part of that community of law and that community of values. I think that's also an important lesson today. Thank you both. I'd like to add uh, two comments. One is <clears throat> maybe uh, if I follow Jan, <clears throat> that this article had the kind of impact and influence which his research is showing, one reason might be that although on the one hand it definitely posited an imaginary of a constitution of Europe 
and European authority, but it insisted that ultimately it flowed back to the member states and that the doctrine of supremacy, for example, would be zero if national judges and national courts did not adhere to it. Uh, and I think that was a reassuring message because it was the possibility of accepting this construct of European constitutionalism, but in a way which was different from other federal states where ultimate authority is in the federal. And yeah, it's not the Supreme Court which has the ultimate authority, but the national courts which have ultimate authority. And I think this kind of combined message might explain why some of that impact or influence because of that message of on the one hand, on the other hand. Uh, listening to the whole debate, and that's my second comment, maybe my father, the rabbi, was right after all when I told him that I planned to study law. And his dry comment was, the world would be a better place if you became a plumber. Well, maybe not such a grim place to end this uh, this session, but uh, let me That's check. Not if grim. That's not grim at all. <laughs> if we have any other questions, I think we don't. I don't see any more questions. If somebody still has something they want to ask, then now is the last time to do it. But otherwise, I think uh, we are done. And I really thank all of you. I thank Jan for a brilliant and very interesting paper. And I thank Professor Weiler for giving his insights. And I, I'm sure that it will help Jan to develop his paper even further. Uh, I thank all the participants. There were very many. We didn't see most of you all, most of the time, but I'm sure that you enjoyed the session. And, uh, and I hope that you stay safe and that we see again soon. Thank you.